Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode, wait for this, 300, 400, 500, I wish. No, it's 232. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning, listeners. Good morning, viewers. We're so excited to be coming at you with 232 shows. But this time, Mike, we're really digging into a bit of a Moonshot's favorite. It's only an individual that we've covered once on the show so far. But here's the important thing, Mike. This episode today is kicking off a brand new series all about this author and individual. It certainly is, and he's got a rather fancy name, I must say. He does have a rather fancy name. Today, listeners and viewers, we are digging back into Michael Bungay Stanier, author of many, many books that we'll cover partly in this series. The book that we've already covered uh, it was uh, Do More Good Work. He's best-selling author of The Coaching Habit, which we'll be digging into today, which, Mike, since its 2016 release, and this is going back a couple of years, so forgive me if my numbers aren't correct, it had sold already over half a million copies within just a short couple of years. So it's really the book that I think has captured a lot of attention with regards to this broad idea of coaching. But I think the difference that and the, the build that you and I can b- bring to our listeners today is how coaching and how the habits and tips that we've got from Michael in this book can be applied to all of our lives, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think one of the mil, uh, the myths that we should dispel is that you know, coaching and mentoring is only for the wise old gray-headed folks, uh, all the CEOs and the managers and the directors of a business. Mm-hmm. In fact, I would go as far as saying we have a chance to mentor and coach each and every one of our colleagues and peers when appropriate. I mean, what a great gift to to have a mindset of how can I help this person improve, grow, be better, get more out of life. I mean, that's a gift. And Mark, I just want to double down and say, if that hasn't lit your fire, not only have we got the techniques you can use to coach, help, and mentor others, you could even use some of these techniques on yourself. So it really doesn't matter where you are within an organization or a team. If you're a living, breathing human, this book is for you, Mark. Wow. I, you know what? That's the type of synopsis mike that i think hits home you know not only can i be a better leader or a colleague but also i can be a better individual i think michael's got a lot to live up to here (laughs) he does and and i love the fact that it really is inspired by and covers a lot of themes from the likes of simon sinek um also the book the one minute manager kim blanchard that we've covered and many 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 others so if you're looking to better understand what's going on how to be a good servant to the people around you and to yourself. Stay tuned because we're going to get into the work of Michael Bungay-Stena and we are going to rock and roll with asking the right questions. That's right, Mike. So let's dive straight in. Let's hear from Michael Bungay-Stena, who's on the Brand Master podcast. He's going to give us an overview of three fundamental questions that come up within his book, The Coaching Habit. Starting on the focus question, give us the premise of that. Yeah. So the focus question is, what's the real challenge here for you? Mm -hmm. And the premise is the first challenge that shows up is never the real challenge. And it's Mm -hmm. rarely the only challenge. We are wired to want to leap into advice giving and solution providing and answer whipping out and all of this sort of stuff. So that when somebody comes and goes, ah, Stephen, here's the thing I'm wrestling with. You're like, oh, you know what? I know how to help fix that. And I want to help you. So you kind of get tempted to go into it. But actually, you know, if you build a reputation in your work or in your life as the person who always figures out the real problem, you just become immensely valuable to those around you. Because mm-hmm. in most organizations, big and small, people are working really hard on the stuff that doesn't really matter because mm-hmm. it's the stuff that presented itself first. So this ability just to stay curious a little bit longer, rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly, which is the kind of the definition I use around coaching, stay curious a little bit longer. Mm. You know, you stay curious about what the real challenge is. And it means that when you really figure out what the real challenge is, 
the answers are going to be actually really helpful. Well, the strategic question says we're always at our best when making choices. And strategy is, in fact, having the courage to make bold choices. Mm. So the strategic question says, if I'm going to say yes to this, what must I say no to? Mm-hmm. You can flip that around. If I'm going to say no to this, what must I say yes to? Yeah. Um, but, but most commonly, it's if I'm going to say yes to this. What, what are the opportunity costs? And what are the things that I have to set up barriers to? And how do I actually commit to this? Because a yes without an understanding of what the no's are and that, that that's the implication of a yes is that it must come with no's. Mm. just means that if you don't do that, you're just piling more yeses on and that doesn't work because everybody's at capacity. Tell us about the learning question. Yeah. So if you lead people, you know, whether you have a big team or a small team, really one of your key jobs is to try and make your people smarter because mm. if they get smarter, they become more competent and more confident, more self-sufficient, and more autonomous. And that is not only good for them, it's good for you and it's good for your organization. Mm-hmm. So it's really helpful if you can help people learn. But it turns out it's really hard to help people learn. <laughs> and one of the annoying things is that advice rarely sticks. You know, advice typically goes in one ear and out the other ear. Yeah. So when you sit down and go, listen, Stephen, here are my pearls of wisdom and nuggets of gold. This is not going to remember most of that most of the time. Yeah. Don't, people don't even really learn when they're doing it. I mean, they mm. do a little bit, but not so much. The power, the most powerful learning moment is when you actively create a moment for the learning. Mm. So that's what this final question, this is number seven of the seven, is about. And the question is, what was most useful or most valuable here for you? Mm. What was most useful or most valuable here for you? Yeah. And you can basically ask that question at the end of any exchange. Mm. I mean, like Stephen can ask this at the end of every podcast. He goes, okay, we've just been talking to this guest. If you had to name what was most useful or most valuable here for you from this conversation, what's the one thing you really want to take away from this podcast conversation? Mm. And you can see how that just turns up the heat a little bit from mm. going, oh, that was interesting. Michael burbled on. Even burbled on, it was perfectly pleasant to listen to. Mm-hmm. To actually saying, name it and, and wire it, get those brain synapses firing mm-hmm. so that you've got a better chance of remembering it. Well, we covered so much in that clip, Mark. I feel like we can kick back and take a cool hour just to break that down. Yeah. Look, <laughs> first thing that I want to call out is the problem that presents itself first is often not the real problem. How true is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I think, based on that um, potentially innate or uncontrollable desire just to change things. You know, oh, here's a problem. Do I run away from it or do I fly into it? I think in a funny sort of way, taking action, and this is certainly for me, Mike, when I've got something that, comes over my my table maybe it's an inbox thing and and it's a good proactive project or maybe it's a question the 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 propensity that i have get on it get it out the way so then i can go back to the other stuff i want to work on so i in a funny ironic sort of way it gets deprioritized because it wasn't there five minutes ago yeah i'd rather get rid of (laughs) you know it's like whack-a-mole right you're just whacking things oh problem Boom. How about that solution? But what Bungai Stainer is really saying is we need to do that classic exercise of what's what's the problem and then why is that a problem because of this? Oh, now why is that a problem because of this and this and this? And investigating, it's the famous five whys from Toyota, and they believe that if you ask why five times, you'll get to the root of a problem. And I think mm-hmm. that... Um, You know, for example, you know, a really good uh, exercise, the website's not working. Why? Uh, Because when I go there, I get an error message. Why? Uh, Well, the message is from the hosting provider. Why is it from them? Uh, Let's have a look. Oh, it appears we haven't paid for the hosting. Why? Because the credit card expired. Oh, that's the problem, right? And so I think it's really setting up an environment when 
two people are working together and someone says, you know, you can see it on the screen here, what's on your mind, what Michael is really encouraging and inviting us to do is to really first just ask questions like why, tell me more, what else, to really extract the context of the problem, go into the layers. Now, if you want to go further into that, we did shows on first principles, second level, second order thinking. We did a whole thinking better series to kind of basically spark your critical thinking. But I think part of the job that we're doing here with this idea, Mark, is reminding everyone that you need to actually pause, reflect, and think before jumping into action. It's like this uh, ancient wisdom of to go fast, you need to go slow, right? To really, <laughs> really think it through first and discuss together. And yeah. I think when anyone's got a problem, I think you and I both see that people have incredible brains and potential. Often our role as a coach or counselor or just a colleague is just to ask questions to get their thinking in order, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're totally right, Mike, because that's, from an individual perspective, the thing that often gets lost. You don't necessarily know how good you are, nor do you necessarily know how to, in a lot of cases, maximize your, your time that you have available. So what ends up happening is you, when you have a long list of, of KPIs and items on the to-do list, rather than dedicating real time to think, and as Michael was breaking down, the real challenge, what is the real challenge that we're trying to solve here? You end up probably creating something that will come back later. So instead of actually addressing the real problem that potentially arises oh. in an early sense, so maybe yes. it's you know the, the preemptive uh, question that somebody asks. Okay, well, yeah, let's let's go out and sort that without, and maybe that's a band aid solution. Let's say it's it's a technical problem. And there's a build that you need to change. Okay, well, let's not spend too much money figuring out what the problem is here. We know it's something to do with this. We'll go out and patch it up rather than spending some real time. Yes. And this could be true of presentations, pitches, any sort of preparation that one needs to do. Instead of really taking a time to plan it out and make it really good, instead rushing into it, could lead to you having to redo it or at least elements of it later down the line. And you know what comes to mind as you were talking then, like how can you understand this better, this situation where we sort of gloss over things, I think is what we're both saying mm -hmm. here, is mm -hmm. the uh, Eisenhower matrix, what's important yes. and urgent. And I think it, invariably we're fighting against a situation where most of our day is dealing with urgency and deferring and delaying importance. Because it's not urgent. I can kind of get away with not t dealing with this. So I have a feeling that what we're really talking about here is asking questions of the important things and not just quickly whack a mole urgent things, smashing through, trying to get to inbox zero, trying to clear things uh, before the Women's World Cup soccer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Guilty. Um, yeah, I think these uh, uh, questions all play a role in helping each other think better because we all want, in mm -hmm. the end of the day, our colleagues and our peers, whether we manage them or not, to do better, right? It's like any sports team. If the defense is playing well, the offense is happy, right? Everyone's winning. Yeah. And I think making time for these questions is perhaps the best single piece of action, the note to oneself to take from today, because I find that in the busy, the busyness of 2023, mm -hmm. making time to ask the questions. Now that we've presented the questions and we can do a big study of them, ask the questions and really see what's on your mind. And Mark, if you don't mind, can I tell you what's on my mind? <laughs> Go on, Mike. I want to listen. Tell me what the uh, the thing is on your mind at the moment. Mark, I am amazed of how many people have been a member 
of the Moonshots podcast for over a year. That's what's on my mind. I think this is amazing. I think, funnily enough, Mike, I had a sense that you might even go into that direction as well. So maybe there, I've been listening in the background after all. But I tell you who else is listening in the background, Mike, and that is indeed our members, many of whom are now reaching a big one two moment, that big annual membership. So as always, please welcome Bob, Marjolin, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, and Lisa, Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Berg, Kalman, Joe, Christian, Samuela, Barbara, and Andre, Eric and Chris, Deborah, Lasse, Steve, Craig, Daniel, Andrew, Ravi, and Yvette, like all of those individuals, are now with us for over a year. Whew. We might have to eventually break up the annual memberships because it's going to need an entire episode just to call them out. <laughs> but obviously, hot on those heels, and we're so, so much gratitude for all of these individuals as well, include Karen, Raul, PJ, Nicolada, Ola, Ingram, Dirk, and Emily, Harry, Karthik, Venkata, Marco, Jet, Roger, Anna, Raw, Nimelen, Diana, Wade, and Christoph, Denise, Laura, Smitty, Corey, Gayla, Bertram, Daniela and Mike, Nelson, Dan, Antonio, Vanessa, Zachary, and our brand new member, Mike, Brian, who's joined us very, very recently. Welcome, Brian. Welcome all of our members. Yeah. Thank you so much for your support. We really love having our members. We love hearing from our members. So go on to Patreon and send us a message if you're a member. If you're yet to become a member, head to moonshots.io, click on the big members button and magic shall happen. Not only will you get a world, a universe of cosmic moonshot karma, you will also get access to the Moonshots Master Series, which is a special show that we produce only for our members. So head over to moonshots.io. And I think that as we've asked ourselves what's on our mind and we're talking things intergalactic, maybe a little bit alien, Mike, I think it's only appropriate that we now start talking about monsters on the Moonshots podcast. <laughs> well, that, that's a segue. I like it. The, the segue there, Mike, is exactly where Michael's going with his book in the uh, coaching habit. And he's got this very, very unique, quite surprising, but I'll tell you what, relatable idea here. And that's all about the advice giving monster. You are an advice giving maniac. I mean, you know what happens. You ask a question or you just get into a conversation and somebody starts talking and after approximately seven seconds, your advice monster has risen up to the dark and gone, oh, oh, I'm going to add some value to this conversation. And now you've moved into fake listening. Oh, sure, you're still nodding your head and looking curious, yet concerned, yet caring, yet thoughtful, and you're making those small grunting noises of encouragement. Mm -hmm, yeah, uh-huh. But I know what's going on. You're just waiting for the opportunity for them to shut up or for you to interrupt so you can tell them that piece of advice that you got, that opinion, that solution, that suggestion. The problem isn't with advice. You know, advice is kind of what makes civilization happen as knowledge passes and changes and becomes more useful. The problem is with your default response to give advice. Mark, it is so tempting to hear a problem and jump, throw ourselves at, what about this? How about this? Maybe you could do this. And, you know, so much of sharing a problem is like just lessening the burden of that problem, right? Is that What's that saying about burdens and, and, and sharing a problem? Can you uh, a problem shared is a problem halved. There we go, right? That's so much part of this. And I'm, I've been really victim of trying to rush to being of help and service when actually, what can you do, Mark? And it's right here. It's right here for those who are our viewers. <laughs> those who right are listening. Here. It is this skill, Mike, this active listening skill. And this is a real game changer. And I, I think it's it's a funny idea because it isn't necessarily something that is surprising, you know, the, the importance of listening. But realistically, it is something that, particularly as you get older into more fast-paced environments such as work, you lose track of it or potentially you get bad habits with regards to your listening. 
And you're right, Mike, a problem shared is a problem halved. Therefore, imagine all the benefit that you can get from sharing your problems with others, but how uh, demoralizing and how uninspiring it is when those colleagues or those individuals aren't really listening. Then you think, well, I'm not going to bother sharing it. Well, I and it think, becomes a vicious cycle. I think you cannot perform the uh, Toyota Five Whys if you're not mm. active listening. Because if you're not truly present as someone, we'll go, let's go back to the example I was giving. The website's not working. Why? Mm. Right? If you're not active listening when you're asking those questions to help your friend or colleague, um, you might start to come across a bit judgmental. Why is the website not working, Mark? Mark, mm. like, you know, and nobody wants to continue a conversation with Mike when he's sounding judgmental or angry <laughs> or frustrated. So this list that we see here is asking open questions like why, tell me more. I think what I'm hearing is this. Is that correct? Right? You know, that, that actually saying it back to them, the summarizing and so forth. But I think there's another part of this, which is when people share things. For example, I had a call very early this morning from someone in the U.S. And um, what they and I were discussing was it was a good thing that it happened and it was an unplanned call. But what was really important is that I establish how exciting the news they had was and how good they must feel that this thing was happening and really almost acknowledging and sharing in the reward recognition and the happiness they were feeling from this moment. Because I think the reason they reached out to call me very early in the morning, still doing my stretching, <laughs> was that they were so excited they wanted to share it. They wanted to bask in the good news together, right? And if I wasn't active listening, I may have taken the conversation another way, but I felt that what this person, if I reflect about it, they just needed to say, look what I've done. They needed like okay. someone to say, well, good on you. That must feel great. And they'd be like, yeah. And they didn't need yeah. it like an hour of praise. They needed just a little moment. And mm. you only get there if you're working hard with your ears and not jumping to conclusions. And I'll, I'll give you a big trick, Mark. And I'm interested to know if you experienced this. I feel if I defer any judgment or solutioning, I feel if I ask three questions on a particular topic that I invariably sense the solution naturally. So I don't need to stress about getting to a solution quickly because I feel like, you know, Toyota says ask why five times. I, th I think Mike's why is ask why three times and it's already pretty good. So <laughs> don't you don't you feel like if you're talking to a friend, a partner, or a colleague, and there's a problem, I feel like the path, even though you might not be ready to talk about it, in your mind it starts to appear certainly by about three like tell me mores, yeah. maybe one clarification. What do you think when you're when you're working with someone? How does it play out? I think you're right. I think it's modular. So sometimes you'll have a problem that's very, very complex, possibly involving different teams, different solutions, different layers, and so, so on, that then you need to dig in that extra little bit. In my experience, it's somewhat similar to yourself, Mike. When I have encouraged colleagues to share something that they're working on, maybe they're stuck, maybe they're going around in circles. Okay, well, I don't know necessarily what you're working on. Why don't you just use me as a sounding board? There's no right or wrong answer. Tell me what the problem is. What I found, in fact, is that sometimes when that individual, and I'm referring actually to a very specific example in my mind, that individual would then talk to me through this problem and they would answer their own question yeah. while walking me through. So but, the know, active listening you know, part you know, of me. You know, the benefit of that, though, is they're 100% going to action the solution because it's their idea. <laughs> it's their idea. Exactly. So I think this, this um, modular element, I suppose we could call it, 
is is it structured in a way that potentially could be even less than three because you're asking that individual, well, just start at the beginning. Yeah. Tell me what's going on. Yeah, totally. And when you go, when they're going through it, I find that occasionally, like you say, maybe it's three. Maybe those three aren't back to back. Maybe they are, okay, well, why is that the problem here? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what else is going on? Okay, why is that the problem there? And invariably, again, and maybe this is only because it's a surface level solution potentially. And actually the job needs to be a little bit deeper. Like I say, those individuals will walk away having shared that problem mm. and having felt as though they had an individual who was listening mm-hmm. and therefore receptive to the, the idea. They feel more confident, feel more confident, yeah. more um, uh, uh, happy with the solution that they've come up with because it's been somewhat stress test. Yes. And I think this, Mike, is something that definitely, for me at least, came down during COVID in the years since. The idea of working more remote, less face-to-face with people. The times that I find were my best collaboration sessions were moments when it was face-to-face. Mm-hmm. Times where you put it up on, on a big whiteboard, come up with an idea, and bounce it backwards and forwards actively listening to each other in order to stress test that idea, figure out whether that solution is in fact correct. Well, what about if a typhoon came? You know, it might be an idea that only your individual, your colleague could come up with by listening to that and thinking, okay, yeah, maybe it's not a typhoon, but maybe there is something unplanned that happens. Yeah, maybe I do need to account for that. And that, similarly to where you went earlier, Mike, is the value, I think, of something like a second order thinking approach yes where you can either go through that yourself and think out all those different potential environments you might run into or potentially even more dynamically and more worthwhile doing that with a a colleague or a friend or a mentor and really utilizing that time with them to to scope out what else might come through through that technique i think is, is pretty beneficial too absolutely you know i i would say that whether people are quote unquote, reporting to you or not, in your mm-hmm. team or not, employing active listening and asking these questions will not only serve uh, the people around you, but talk about natural leaders emerging through active listening, asking why, what's on your mind, what's keeping you up at night, and just really taking it in and letting that person share, building and clarifying together with them. That is the value of active listening. And I tell you what, Mark, I love active listening. I'm, you know, one mm. of my favorite parts of I go into the Spotify app and we can see the feedback now that you can leave per episode in Spotify. You can go and say, I love this episode on Michael, Michael Bungay Stainer. But Mark, there's somewhere else you could go. If you wanted to write some feedback in a podcast app, there is another place you can leave reviews. Is that not true? Mm. Yes, there is, Mike. And I believe it's something called the Apple Podcast app. If you are listeners listening in via Apple Podcast, feel free. In fact, we encourage it. Pop open the app, leave us a rating or even a review because every single time we get a notification that one of you have got in touch with us, we will read it, we will condense it, we will understand and reply to it. So thank you so much. And maybe even give you a shout out on the show. (laughs) Maybe that's the real call to action here, Mike. And for those of you that are watching, uh, you will know that we answer all the comments on uh, YouTube within literally 48 hours. We do get quite a bit of commentary already. I think, Mark, we already have like three or 4,000 people subscribing to the show on YouTube. We now make a video version. So for those of you listening to us, head over to YouTube because you will find at least the fine looking young gentleman of Mark Pearson Freeland. This Mike guy, (laughs) he's a bit dodgy, he's a bit hard on the eyes, but I tell you what, soldier through it because we've got more questions from Michael Bungay Stainer to help you become a better coach. So where do we go next, Mark? Well, Mike, look, I think it is obviously the moonshot show, but there's an individual who we often bring into the fold and that's productivity game. So now let's hear from Productivity Game, who's going to build on where we've been leading today on Michael Bungay Stania's book. And he's going to lean specifically into four big questions that he believes are worth uh, exploring even further. 
Question number one, what's on your mind? When you ask what's on your mind, you invite the person you're coaching to skip the small talk and get to what matters. Stanier says, rather than talk about the weather or how their sports team is doing and any other superficial, boring, and simply useless chit-chat, get to what matters. What's provoking anxiety? What's all-consuming? What's waking them up at 4 a.m.? When you ask what's on your mind, you're essentially saying, I'm here for you. I want to help you work through whatever's bothering you. But if you ask what's in your mind and you still feel like you're holding something back, follow up their answers with what else? What else acts like a pressure relief valve. It gives them permission to open up and allow important but uncomfortable issues to flow out. Stanier says asking what else creates more wisdom, more insights, and more self-awareness than any other question. But there's one downside to asking what else. You may get flooded with a long list of challenges. They might tell you about those four projects they're worried about, the five people they're frustrated with, or the two angry emails they don't know how to respond to. It's tempting to pick out what you think the most important problem is and start offering advice. But if you tell someone what to do, you're essentially raising your status and lowering theirs by saying, hey, I have all the answers and you don't. When you lower their status, you strip them of the confidence they need to make their own decisions. So instead of deciding what they should focus on, ask them. What's the real challenge here for you? You see, when someone's stressed and overwhelmed, everything feels like a challenge. But when you ask someone, what's the real challenge here? You get the person you're coaching to pause and look inward and determine what one challenge, if resolved, would provide the greatest relief. Or put another way, what rock in their backpack of challenges could you help them remove and alleviate the most amount of stress? Yesterday morning, Cleaning my house would have provided me with a mild sense of relief, but I knew that finishing this video would provide me with the greatest sense of relief at that time. I find that the real challenge is often the challenge I'm avoiding most. So the next time you're coaching someone through a stressful situation, and they insist on focusing on petty issues that you know won't matter a week from now, say, that sounds like a challenge, but what's the real challenge here for you? When you include the word you in your question, you make the question easier to answer. In a 1997 study, researchers discovered that when the word you was presented in a math question, students came to a solution faster and more accurately than if you was left out. So to help someone prioritize, ask them, what's the real challenge here for you? Once they discover their real challenge, help them develop a strategy to overcome that challenge by asking them the fourth and final question. If you're saying yes to this, what are you saying no to? In other words, If you're saying yes to dealing with this challenge, how are you going to make space to focus on that challenge? If you're saying yes to completing a challenging project, are you going to say no to useless meetings, even if saying no might upset your boss or your coworkers? If you're saying yes to being self-employed and turning that passion project into a profitable business, are you willing to say no to distractions and delete Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram off your phone? Are you willing to say no to watching TV at night and going out with friends on the weekend? Saying yes to overcoming a real challenge requires more time and energy than the person you're coaching may think. By asking, if you're saying yes to this, what are you saying no to? You're helping them strategically free up time and energy to focus on what matters. As business coach Michael Porter says, the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. Oh boy, Mark, uh, saying no. I mean, I can go so many places with that. But I, I just, I kind of want to park that for a moment and rem- remind people of what was at the front of that clip and discuss it together. Because when we rush to offer, here's what you should do. When we say those words, mm. we're effectively saying, I know better than you. Yeah. So the real science of it is you actually create hierarchy, which isn't great for an open learning vibe, if you know what I mean. No. So no. I think it's really important to try and act as a guide to helping someone uncover the solution themselves um, and prompting, nudging them along the way rather than you trying to be the talismanic guru appearing with great theater and aplomb. da da your solution is this. You just need to do three steps. Be God with you. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to point out, I find that very helpful to overcome the temptation of, you know, being the advice monster, right? 
Yeah, I, I think this is a, a very, very big um, takeaway from that clip we just heard, as well as the book itself. Because for me, Mike, yeah, I've certainly been guilty of that. I've certainly been guilty of jumping in. <clears throat> and, and you're right. It does create that subconscious idea within us. And again, I've, I've been on the receiving end of it. And whether I would care to admit it or not, it probably is something that made me feel insecure. Yep. Made me feel maybe perhaps less capable. Yep. I think the other piece, Mike, that was again at, at the front end of that clip, which I know you're, you're going to gravitate to as well, is jumping to the meat of the conversation. Yeah. So the idea of when we're sitting down with an individual, let's say it's a colleague, um, maybe it's somebody who's come to us with a real problem, rather than taking up a lot of time. And, and sometimes I've been on the other side, the time when I, I want to you know, express some frustration, anxiety, tell them what's keeping me up at night. But the, the groundwork that you, know, you have to put in, that soft talk, sometimes gets in the way and it really eats into the time yeah. that you want to try and share the problem. Maybe, maybe getting to the solution is the next step. Yes. But being able to actually share the problem, take your hat off and, and raise a hand and say, actually, I need help. Sometimes that's a pretty hard thing to do. Oh, so you're to, spot on there because right? many of the times these conversations um, are not with willing participants. And what I mean is let's use, let's use the metaphor of Dr. Patient right? Let's say we're the doctor, Mark, and one of our colleagues is the patient and they've got a problem. Sometimes they don't know they've got a problem. No. Sometimes they know they've got a problem, but they don't want to talk about it because they're embarrassed and they feel like it looks like they're a failure. Mm. Sometimes things have got so bad they have to talk about it, but they are not willing to take ownership for it. Which means you have to cover all of this ground before you can even consider solutions, or in this case, a medicine for the patient. Because if they don't agree that the arm's broken, they won't go into surgery to have it straightened out, right? Like they yeah. won't, they'll reject it. Um, and I think yeah. this is absolutely essential to realize that you may not get it first time in the first conversation, it might take days or weeks. And it all comes down to shut the you know what up, ask the right questions, yeah. and really help people clear their mind, clear their heart of what's really bothering them, so that you can move on to really embracing, okay, well, we have a clear problem. This is a success already because a clear solution requires a clear problem statement, right? And good yeah. solutions come from a clearly defined problem. So I feel like that's sort of the momentum build out of the back of that, don't you? Yeah, I really, really do. And I think there's an element there which really reinforces this idea of awareness and awareness of potentially your colleague, but also an awareness within yourself. You need to be aware of that big question that we heard at the beginning, what's keeping you up at night? Sometimes we might not even know what's keeping us up at night yeah. because we're so potentially oblivious to it. Yeah. And through very simple acts, such as we've discussed on the show before, obviously a, a favorite for ours is journaling. This is a big one for me when I do have myself, when I'm, you know, literally being kept up at night, mm. the thing that I'll go to will be journal. Oh, yeah, it exactly. will help me then, you know, get out maybe that, I wouldn't say frustration, but any confusion that I might have. Mm. And more often than not, it'll help me figure out, hey, that's funny. I never thought I felt like this, but actually mm. sounds like that's that's where it's going. But that self-awareness, I think, really leans into the ability to, you know, A, raise a hand, but also B, be an active listener. Mm. Be conscious of how you're going across as you're sitting on the other side of the table. Be conscious of how you are uh, either A, giving advice, or be receiving it, I suppose. My, this bit, bit, brings up a lot of memories for me with Chris Voss. Yes. You know, the negotiation techniques that we were really learning from him lean into this, I think, particularly that active listening, as well as the usage of you and the hierarchy that you can subconsciously create. The, uh, the other book and show that I would reference is 
leaders eat last by Simon Sinek, which really enforced the fact the job of the leader is to put the needs of his subordinates first and to care for them, right, and to nurture them. Um, Now, we have presented in this book about coaching from Michael Bungay Stainer. We've presented seven questions, four questions, and we're going to keep on a little bit on this question thing because, Mark, in this world where we need radical simplification, minimalization, he actually has a favorite question, and I think it would be very good to understand what that is. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. It's very well for you and I to have our favorites, as I'm sure we'll discuss shortly. But let's hear from Michael, who's now talking to Marshall Goldsmith, and he's going to talk about how he's got one particular, I'm not going to spoil it, favorite out of those seven that he wants to share with us now. I love your philosophy, and I love the idea of asking questions. Yeah. You have to say, what is that one question that's the yeah. most important? What is it? Well, I love that you asked me that, because in the book, I'm like, here are the seven questions. Right, and right. if you have these seven questions, mm. it's not going to help. It's not going to save you every time, but it will be good for you almost every time. Right. And then I get asked all the time, so what's your favorite question? Of right. those seven, what's your favorite question? What's the one? And I'm like, well, I love them all. They're like, I don't have children. But if I did have children, they'd be like my children. I'm like, they're all great in their own way. Right. But if there was one question I would say, this is the best coaching question in the world, Mm -hmm. I think there is that question. What is it? Three words. Just three words. The acronym for the three words, A-W-E. So it's literally an awesome question. (laughs) And the question is this, and what else? And what else? And what else? And I know when I tell people that's the best coaching question in the world, Mm -hmm. there's almost a palpable sense of anti-climax in the room because they're like, oh, I thought it was going to be something amazing, something that would open up the universe. It does. And what else? Well, thank you for saying that because here's why and what else is so powerful. Two reasons. First reason is this. The first answer somebody gives you is almost never their only answer Mm. and it's rarely their best answer. Right. So if you leave with any of the other questions, like what's the real challenge here for you? Or Mm. what do you want? Or um, what what was most valuable from this conversation? Mm. They'll give you their first answer and then you go, great, and what else? And they'll always have something else to say and you're helping them learn. You're helping to be a teacher for them there. But here's the second reason and what else is so powerful. It's a self-management tool. Because what I would say is that most people struggle to keep curious in conversations. Mm. And when somebody normally goes, you you say something like, so what's the challenge here? Mm. And they give you an answer. Mm. Part of you goes, oh, this is amazing. We found an answer. Let's get on it. Mm. And what I would call the advice monster springs up out of the dark and goes, oh, this is great, Marshall. I'm about to add some value to this conversation with my advice monster. And what you're trying to do is tame your advice monster. Just keep it a bit quiet in the background. And mm-hmm. asking and what else is a self-management tool to keep your advice monster quiet, mm. stay curious a little bit longer, and let's see where this conversation actually goes. And what else? I mean, this is music to my ears. Um, I've really only framed it as asking why a lot, like why and why and why. But mm. I actually do like and what else? Because you're inviting them to go further and beyond. And what, like, what a golden rule is like, listen to understand. I mean, this was one of the Stephen Covey rules. But most importantly, just keep asking questions to your colleague, your peer, and just don't be in a rush. And what else? And after that and why is that and how did that work and help me understand explain that some more or why was that such a challenge and i think Mm -hmm. like the big lesson here is have empathy for the people you're working with take time to ask questions and man i am such a firm believer in humanity mark i think that we all have this incredible smarts and potential and I think asking questions and, and, and safe discussion is the path to unlocking that potential. Because if you feel safe that you're not going to be judged for what you're going to say and that you can truly speak what's really happening, Patrick Lencioni would say you're building the trust behind the five layers of a high-performing team. Yeah, I think you're totally right, Mike. I think what's the only build I can do there 
is what Michael was saying <clears throat> in that final clip, that the, re- the first answer that either you give or somebody else gives is rarely either A, the actual answer, or B, the best. Or the like entire. I th- yeah, I think it's like, you know, the Russian dolls, how there's these layers yeah. that you need to exactly. kind of remove, like an onion, you need to cut through, peel it off, cut through, peel it off. Yeah. And sometimes that's easier with people that you're really familiar with. Sometimes it's not. But if you always start a problem solving conversation and say, I'm a coach and I'm going to peel back the layers here to help the other person, you're effectively saying, What's keeping you up? And what else? Mm. Why? Tell me more. Help me understand. Like getting those prompts rolling. And frankly, just trust your intuition that solutions and at least pathways will appear to you. Within 30 minutes, for sure. Within 30 minutes. Yeah, I agree. And and really, Mike, this this reminds me that a lot of the time when you turn in, let's say you have a deliverable, let's say it's um, a, a book, something extreme, maybe it's a presentation or a pitch. Again, rather than spending an hour or so throwing it out via email and saying, cool, that was good enough, we've got to hold ourselves accountable and think, is that really the best I can do? Am I holding myself up to a high enough standard? Should I, like we've discussed on the show, make a bit of a skeleton uh, idea? Let's have a table of content. Let's really think about what this approach should be. Then I'll come back to it. Again, using and what else? You're creating that pause in conversation. I would argue, Mike, that we could also create a pause in the deliverable uh, deliveries of work. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's just a walk around the block. Maybe it's just a conversation with a colleague or better still, a day or so to let it sit. I think creating that time to let things sort of percolate, to let your ideas come through, to make sure that the work you've about to hand in is going to be the best it can be. Fundamentally, I think that's going to then circumvent any negative feedback that maybe a leader or a manager is going to give because you're taking the action upon yourself. Mm. You're putting yourself into their uh, Mm. position and think, well, what else would they ask of me? Maybe I can ask of it myself so that somebody else doesn't need to. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, this is just so right for this moment when we're so busy. This is about pause and reflection and conversation. And frankly, it Mm. just sounds more rewarding and more meaningful it's a way of working doesn't it (laughs) it sounds really nice (laughs) you know know, again this idea of active listening although it might not sound like such a a big reveal i really think it is because if every conversation and important conversation that i have i knew that the other person was really listening really wanting to help and i do it every time Mm. Mm. it's really true so listen, Mark, we've covered four questions, seven questions. We've talked about monsters and aliens. What's going to be your homework assignment coming out of this show? That's a tricky one, Mike. I think the, I think this idea of what else is actually going to be the thing that sticks with me today. Because, again, as you've just highlighted, it's a very, very fast-paced time, very fast-paced world. We're somewhat addicted maybe. To, to getting things off our plate as quickly as possible, take a breath, mm. have a pause, mm. ask what else? Mm. What else could I put into this presentation? Mm. What else could I do that would be a value add? Maybe I can give my clients something else, a little bonus that would help them remember who I am and the work that I'm doing. What else can I do not only for listening, but action as well, I think is sticking out for me. What about you, Mike? What's coming out from Michael Bunge Stania today? I like the thing of, you know, what you say yes to means what are you saying no to? Yeah, I that's think, a good one. I think that's something I can work on. So I have my homework assignment. So, Mark, I want to thank you. I want to thank our members, our viewers, our listeners for this, which has been show 232 with Michael Bungay Steiner and his book, The Coaching Habit. And we had four big chapters 
The first of which was we laid the foundation. We learned to listen and to ask. And we knew quite squarely we were facing off against the biggest challenge, the advice monster, where we want to have all the answers oh so quickly. But we realized we do a little listening. We can ask seven or maybe your favorite four questions, which is all about understanding what's going on, asking what else, asking how can we get committed to understanding this and to the solution to and empowering the person, not creating hierarchies. And when in doubt, if you're lost in these conversations of coaching, just ask, and what else? And the path will appear. And I hope it does appear so that you can learn out loud together so that you can become the best version of yourself in the best performing teams. Because that's what we're all about here on the Moonshots Podcast. That's a wrap.